I'm Rich Lee from the Hall Institute of Public Policy, and welcome to the Hall Institute Forum. New Jersey newspapers have a long and distinguished history in our state. The print media also has been especially important throughout New Jersey's history, largely because the electronic media, television, and radio tend to be dominated by the major media markets to our north and to our south, New York and Philadelphia. With us today to discuss New Jersey newspaper history and to maybe take a look um, towards the future is Jerry Omenti, who's written a book about New Jersey newspapers. Jerry, welcome to Hall Institute. Nice to be here, Rich. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jerry, I was kind of short with your introduction because I know you have many credentials uh -huh. and we've had the opportunity to work together and collaborate sure. in the past, so I'm familiar with your background, but maybe if you could share with our viewers um, a little bit about what you bring to the table, and maybe starting with your career as a journalist. Mm -hmm. Good. I Actually, I, I became interested in journalism in, in, um, at Rutgers Newark and was editor of the co college paper, and I was then working part-time for the Newark News as a copy boy. Uh, went to Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. After that, started working for the uh, Newark Evening News. Uh, went overseas to work with the Paris Tribune. Came back to work with the Detroit News. Uh, and then uh, had a Neiman Fellowship to Harvard and spent a year studying urban affairs and Canadian affairs. Uh, and then at, at, at that point, about 1969, I joined Rutgers University as an associate professor uh, and set up a program in urban communications. Uh, eventually that became a separate department of journalism and, me and media studies. Uh, I also created something called the, the Journalism Resources Institute, and that trained about 14,000 journalists during the time I was there. Uh, so over the years, we've done a lot of work with the journalists in New Jersey and then in the region, and then more recently, from 1989 on, I've been overseas about 160 times working with journalists from uh, Central and East Europe, from Russia, uh, from the Balkans, uh, from Western Europe, Latin America. Uh, I just came back from Kosovo last week. Uh, I'll be going to Beirut in, at the end of the month. Uh, and basically, uh, have had a really nice combination of being a working journalist at the same time coming to the university uh, and ending up as chair of the department and then the director of the institute. Yeah, that's great. I think whenever someone can combine the professional mm -hmm. practical experience with the academic mm -hmm. background, the students benefit. Uh, well, so, something that um, you said, you mentioned you know, way back when you were a copy boy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, in looking at your book, uh, there was kind of a, a funny story about how you actually maybe got, the, got it into your blood to be a journalist. Um, I think you ended up at this, in the center of some story. Um, yeah, yeah, well, there were, well, there are two things. One is that I, I was an English literature major and a French literature minor, and, mm -hmm. and I didn't know what I was going to do with this. And I went to an English club picnic, and they said, well, why don't you start writing stories for the paper? And I went to, uh, uh, down to Camp Kilmer to interview Hungarian re refugees and who were part of the whole revolution mm -hmm. of 56, 57 in that period. Got, that got me into it. I think the story that you're thinking of when I was at the Newark News as a copy boy, I went out on uh, Market Street mm -hmm. that was every one, night. Yeah. That was my chore to go out and get coffee and donuts and then hope I could get paid for it when I got back. Mm -hmm. um, there were a whole row of skid row bars there and one of the bars, one of the security people was beating on a, um, a, a, a drunk who didn't, mm -hmm. didn't know where he was, mm -hmm. quite frankly, and he just kept hitting him. So I said, why don't you, you know, not hit him? He doesn't mm -hmm. He doesn't know what's up. So he said, all right, you're under arrest. <laughs> so I'm there with this poor drunk, and somebody from the Star-Ledger walked by and saw me, and they ran up to the Newark News staff and said, they're beating up your copy boy on Market Street. So suddenly the half of the, uh, the night side came out running out, the, two of the editors, the copy readers, the reporters. They call for a photographer first to make sure that they would get a picture of this. So that was my little uh, first experience with uh, the vagaries of, of press power. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, there's you know, a lot of marvelous stories like that in your book. But uh, just going back to when you made the switch, and I don't know if it was you know, a black and white thing mm -hmm. from being a journalist to being an academic, what, what attracted you to, you know, to go that route to you know, you know, start working with students? Well, I think the thing that, uh, there had been one occasion before when I had an offer to teach at Rutgers, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I had 
gotten to know Mason Gross very well, who was the president of, of the university. Uh, but at that point, I said, no, I, think I still want to keep mm -hmm. uh, working as a journalist. I think it was the year at Harvard that really got me thinking that I really like a university mm -hmm. atmosphere and I like working with students. Uh, so luckily, I was able to continue doing my writing. I've written four books, five books since then, uh, done a lot of magazine work. Uh, so the shift in journalism was away from daily journalism. But the real opportunity was working with young people. I mean, I, I really, uh, I've probably I have maybe 35, 40 years now of experience with working with former students who are now professionals. That whole opportunity to create new programs to sort of follow the flow of journalism as it changed, uh, and certainly, you know, we'll be talking more about this, but wh where, it's where it is now in terms of major change. But each step along the way, the university was a, a wonderful environment for this, to, yeah. to try this out. Yeah, I remember I went to a panel that you um, put together about a year or so ago, where you had a number of your former students mm -hmm. there, and I could see the great respect they had for you, but also I could see a lot of pride that you had, you know, that you were sitting mm -hmm. there with people who were now working for MSNBC, Wall Street Journal, some of the other major news organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. We're going to take a short break now, but when we come back, we're going to spend a few minutes, you know, talking about this book that you've written on New Jersey newspaper history. So we'll be back shortly. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rich Lee, and welcome back to the Hall Institute Forum. Our guest today is Jerry Omente, a professor emeritus at Rutgers University, a journalist, and the author of From Ink on, in, on, From Ink on Paper to the Internet, a book about New Jersey newspaper history. Jerry, can you tell us a little bit about this book, its origins? I know you worked with the New Jersey Press Association yes. on the project. Well, the New Jersey Press Association in, in the year 2007 was celebrating its 150th anniversary, the oldest continuing uh, press association in the United States. Uh, John O'Brien, who is the executive director, asked if I would consider doing a book about the history of the newspapers of the state. So I said yes, and, uh, but I wanted to uh, do more than just a, an overall history. I wanted to look at what was happening in terms of new media technologies, especially the internet, how, how it was affecting the survival of the papers, and, and how do they reinvent themselves. So the book is sort of like two books. It, on one track, it's the history with some really wonderful stories about major people uh, in the national media and, and in, the, in the local and regional media. And the other story is the story of the technology and how newspapers are probably facing their most crucial existence right now and, and their survival. Uh, and it seemed to work because at the time we were thinking of, well, I interviewed all of the editors and publishers around the state and in the region, and I asked them to think in a time frame of 10 years out, 30 years out. Uh, we since have found, the book came out in, in 2007, 2008, uh, it won the SPJ award, uh, but basically uh, my timeline was too long. Uh, there's a real crisis in the, in the, in the uh, uh, newspaper industry in New Jersey and nationally and internationally right now mainly because the internet is like an asteroid that just slammed into uh, the whole media landscape and is changing the, the whole face of not only print but radio and television and everything else. So that's really the theme running through the book. Yeah, and definitely even right here in New Jersey we're seeing you know, a lot of you know, what you talked about you know, happening. A lot of times New Jersey is somewhat of a bellwether state. Things happen mm -hmm. here before they happen elsewhere. But let's go back maybe you know, to the early days. How how, how long ago did newspapers start in New Jersey? If I, it wasn't even before the Revolutionary War, we had some sort of. There were some. There were there were some pamphlets that that were hung in the in, in the taverns, for instance. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the real first formal newspapers came uh, during the Revolutionary War, and it was interesting in that New Jersey and Delaware were two of the colonies that didn't have their own weekly papers. Mm -hmm. The governor of New Jersey convinced the legislature at the request of George Washington that we needed a paper in New Jersey. So one was started in, in Trenton. Mm -hmm. And that basically, in that period of, of the Revolutionary War, was, was the first, first weekly paper. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there was a, a, a gradual increase in the number of papers. Uh, and to the point where New Jersey became really one of the, high, the highest density not only highest density states, but the highest density of, of weekly and daily papers in the country. Mm -hmm. 
partly because it didn't have its own television. Right. I mean, it, it had some very good public TV uh -huh. with NJN, but basically had no commercial television license in the state, so that this was a, a field day for the uh, newspapers. And so you, you get a concentration here that you don't see in other parts of the country. Yeah. As you looked at New Jersey newspaper history, did you see like trends or different eras? Like, or was there a steady evolution or were there you know, kind of benchmarks along the way mm -hmm. as to what happened? Yeah, they were, uh, basically newspapers uh, didn't have a glorious start. They were primarily people who owned a print shop and, and were doing job work and then they needed to do something else and they started doing these weekly papers. Uh, but the whole history as it, as, as it evolves, I, I was fortunate in being able to find the original records going back to the uh, early and mid 19th, 19th century where the New Jersey Press Association was basically trying to evolve as a, as a, as a profession. Mm -hmm. The issues of ethics, what should you do and not do if you're, if you're owning a newspaper, uh, how vigorous should you be in, uh, in, in doing investigative reporting. I mean, I've got a number of stories where, uh, in the case of the record, for instance, uh, in Hackensack, New Jersey, uh, the publisher of that paper at one point was so threatened by people who, uh, in organized crime who didn't like the exposés he was doing that the whole family was under protection. The publisher had a submachine gun in his office plus three other guns. Uh, there was another case of a publisher down the shore at uh, the Asbury Park Press who was told by one of the local townspeople that, you know, we don't like the coverage so don't come to the meetings anymore. Uh, he showed up at one of the meetings, put a gun on the table and said, I'm here to cover the story and if anybody has a problem, let me know. So we have that kind of, of uh, Wild West thing right. happening. But at the was same that typical? I mean, was that happening in other parts no, of the country? I, well, I'm sure. Uh, yes, it was. Yeah. I'm sure. as, as a matter of fact, we did have, well, there was one, one killing of an editor who was at his desk uh, where somebody came in and didn't like the coverage. And, you know, that's a, it's a tough way to do criticism. Yes. Uh, but basically, uh, yeah, the, 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 the whole newspaper industry was very rowdy in, in the early 19th century. Mm -hmm. It was, it was very partisan, it was tied to parties, it was tied to, uh, uh, in some cases, religious beliefs. And, but it, it was, it was a, a place where people were really rolling up their sleeves and taking a swing at each other with words. Uh, it evolved into a much more serious kind of situation as a mass medium developed. Uh, and now, do we take it up to the point, you know, it survived radio, it survived television, and then suddenly it comes to the internet, and the internet is not just one more medium coming along. Mm -hmm. it, the, the internet is basically the, the hand connecting all of the pieces, and then it's, at some point, uh, the internet is just chopping it down. I mean, uh, we're in the middle of, as you know, some really major uh, economic changes, mm -hmm. buyouts, right. people disappearing from the newspapers right, right now. Okay, well, actually, that's a really a perfect segue because we're about ready for a break. But when we come back, I um, want to talk about you know, what the Internet is doing to the media, not only in um, New Jersey, but across the country. So we'll be back soon. Thanks. Hello, I'm Rich Lee of the Hall Institute of Public Policy, and welcome back to the Hall Institute Forum. We've been speaking with Jerry Omenti, professor emeritus at Rutgers University, journalist and author. And we've been speaking mostly about the history of New Jersey newspapers, but in our final segment, I wanted to talk a little bit about maybe the present and the future. You mentioned your book is almost like, kind of runs across two tracks and mm -hmm. talks about what is likely to happen 10 years out, 20 years out. Um, as we speak, you know, the fate of the Star-Ledger is uncertain. There's been cutbacks at other newspapers. Um, the Bergen Record is going to mobile reporters. What's happening in this industry? Well, it's it's... The analogy really is an aster. If the media landscape had newspapers, books, magazines, radio, television, it was a fairly orderly place. They were like chickens on a roof. Mm -hmm. A new medium came along and the other chickens moved over. Suddenly, in 1995, the internet, the web as we know it, mm -hmm. started to appear. It took about three or four years, but by the year 2000, it was very clear that the internet was not another chicken on the roof. And as a matter of fact, the the internet burned on the chicken coop. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it really is, it, it's a massive situation now where newspapers are feeling it more than uh, radio and television, although radio and TV are, are also in the same boat of being needing to transform themselves. 
people are simply not reading as many newspapers as they used to. Uh, and this started before the internet. In the 1960s and 70s and 80s, there was a steady drop to the point where at one point, 80% of the country might have been reading a paper every day. Today, that, that number is close to 35 or 36%. Mm. Uh, and at the same time, young people who are used to uh, iPods and, and uh, uh, handheld phones and laptops and are used to reading on a screen are uh, moving away from paper and that's where the title from ink, mm -hmm. from ink on Paper right. to the Internet comes from. Uh, so you've got this, at, on the one hand, you have people who are simply not using the old, you know, network television is also losing a large part mm -hmm. of its uh, news audience. People are, are, are moving to the Internet uh, not only because they can get 20 or 30 different sources right away, but they can get audio, they can get graphics. Uh, and the other thing is they, they can interact with each other. They, the power of the internet is not only my reading a story in the New York Times, but then being able to talk to other people about it, and in some cases talk directly to the reporter. Right. And, and, and this has changed the whole industry. And what is happening is, internet is sort of sucking out the, uh, the revenues. Uh, the classified used to be a third of the, of the newspaper revenue. Uh, yeah, but I that heard, like, is, Craigslist is devastating you know, classified revenue. Yeah, the, uh, all of the all of the, all of the re the national and, and also regional mm -hmm. kinds of of, uh, of uh, internet mm -hmm. sites. You know, whether whether you're selling something or meeting somebody or whatever it happens to be, that used to be a, a paid classified ad that's disappeared disappearing. At the, the other thing is that we've got a terrible economy, a, a situation of you know financial meltdown, mm -hmm. so that. The, the newspapers are faced with that. That would have been bad ordinarily, but on top of that, now they've got to readjust. Now, this is all uh, uh, doom and gloom. Mm -hmm. The positive side of it is that newspapers are in a very special position. They're a branded, trusted source. If they can stay in there long enough to reinvent themselves, to become not just a delivery truck with newspapers, but a, a delivery truck with uh, the internet and other other technologies that we don't even think about yet in the next five or ten or twenty years there's going to be a change but my timeline which was saying okay what's going to happen thirty years from now is now down to what is happening in the next five or ten years mm -hmm. and we see in New Jersey a canary in the mine in a sense what happens here is happening all over the country uh, newspapers are not going to disappear but they're going to be radically changed and a lot of them are going to go down and again, using that asteroid theory hitting the landscape, the big elephants, the, uh, the big dinosaurs are probably having a harder p time at this point than the smaller under the r radar kinds of mm -hmm. things. The, the weekly, highly local weekly and community papers may be able to do, hang in there a little bit longer. But a paper like the Star Ledger, which was a source of both state and national, international news. Now that national, international is taken away, classifieds are taken away, uh, and they've got to find a new economic model. Yeah. Is there any organization, news organization, that you've seen either in New Jersey or actually anywhere in the country that actually is ahead of the curve, that maybe has, has done a good job of, of seeing what's coming down the line and has adjusted more than other places? Well, I mean, I think the Star-Ledger has done a really good job of, of being aware of these changes. It just mm -hmm. is moving so fast that it can't catch up with it. But I would say that if you look at, say, the model of uh, NBC, mm -hmm. uh, MSNBC, CNBC for financial, uh, they've really gotten their arms around the whole issue of, of delivering information 24 hours a day in various modes multi-platform, multimedia. Uh, Bloomberg News is a good example of this. The New York Times is, a, is, a, is, a, is a doing really well, Washington Post. I mean, the New York Times now has 16 to 18 to possibly 20 million people who are using that newspaper online, uh -huh. whereas uh, they sell about 1.8 million a day mm -hmm. of, the, of, the, of the paper product. Yeah. With um, young people, as you say, you know, growing up, getting their information differently than, than you and mm -hmm. I would. Do you think they're ever going to go back to reading or start reading newspapers? Uh, I think it's getting harder and harder to do it. You've got to give them a reason to. I mean, John Stewart was asked, how do you get young people to read newspapers? And he said, reinstitute the draft. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, it sounds, a little, it sounds a little bit selfish, but the idea is really that 
what is really of importance to uh, younger people? I mean, it, it's not all fluff. It's not all Brittany mm -hmm. and, and all the other things. That they're concerned about world issues. They're concerned about the environment. They're concerned about careers, about surviving in a job market that doesn't exist for them. But you've got to speak to that, and you have to speak to them in, uh, in the channels that, that can reach them. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, here again is where the reporter who used to just write for the newspaper has to be able to write for that internet, you know, the audio, the graphics, the, the video, all of these things come together. Right, exactly. Well, Jerry, I've enjoyed having you here. The time's gone by really fast. There's sure a lot more we could talk about at the issue, but um, I want to thank you for being here. And if, I wonder if you could just quickly let people know if they wanted to get a copy of the book. Who to sure. The best thing would be to uh, contact the New Jersey Press Association, and John O'Brien is the executive director. And then through the other, other source would be New Jersey Heritage Books, uh, either one of those would be the uh, source okay. for this. Okay, well thank you once again. This is Rich Lee for the Hall Institute of Public Policy. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time. Hi, this is Rich Lee for the Hall Institute of Public Policy and welcome to the Hall Institute Public Forum, our um, live interactive um, internet t television show. We're broadcasting live from the Hall Institute offices in Trenton. Um, if you're watching us live, I'd encourage you to look for the chat icon on your screen. Uh, log on there. You can talk with other people who are viewing the shows. If you have a question or a comment, you can post it there. You know, we'll try to get it on the air during our program. Um, the show is archived, so if you're not watching us, us live, um, we still want your input. I encourage you to contact the Hall Institute, either visit our website at hallnj.org or email us at info at hallnj.org because you know, we're very interested in your thoughts on public policy. And you know, today, um, the media is a big part of public policy, not just in New Jersey, but throughout our nation. And I'm pleased to have with me um, Josh McMahon. Josh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Okay. Uh, Josh has a long and distinguished career in journalism in New Jersey. I guess um, our paths first crossed. Uh, I was you know, assigned to the State House, um, working for a different paper. You were the bureau chief of the Star Ledger. I know from there you went on to the Newark office, worked on the editorial page for a while. But uh, for viewers, I think you had one of those jobs where your work was reflected in the paper every day, but people reading the Star Ledger might not have known who Josh McMahon was because, you know, you weren't a reporter with a byline all the time. So I wonder if, you know, maybe you can fill in some of the gaps, you know, before you came to the Ledger or um, what, you know, your journalism career was like prior to that. Actually, the job at the Ledger was the first job oh, I really? got so, right out of college. Nice. Yeah, so it was sort of, you know, that's where I was in 72. Uh -huh. And what did you do? Uh, it started at night rewrite, uh -huh. uh, and, you know, where everybody sort of starts and, you know, work all night and rewriting other people's stuff that comes in. Um, then I went on and, and came down to Trenton, I think it was in 1975, and started covering the courts and legal mm -hmm. affairs and did that with the uh, first the appellate division, then the Supreme Court. And then took over as the, the bureau mm -hmm. chief and basically ran the, I don't know, we had 10, 11 people at the right. time and ran the bureau. Um, and like you said, I sort of behind the scenes, my name wasn't there, but I was the one who was deciding what was covered, where it was covered, who was covering what and um, how to do it. And uh, over those years, I was there till I guess the 93 or something. You, you really got a good education into how government works, mm -hmm. uh, how uh, also how the courts work and, and how uh, it all functions and um, and was there for some of the most exciting things, the Karen and Quinlan decision, right. uh, some of the school decisions. I was there when they passed the income tax, um, the Mount Laurel cases, uh, uh, the right to, the, uh, Karen and Quinlan was right to die. Um, so I was there for a lot of that and watched that all evolve and how it, how it all works. And then I moved to, to Newark, as you said, and uh, was in charge of our we call the government and politics. So mm -hmm. I was in charge of our Washington Bureau, the Trenton Bureau, and uh, all government stuff, as well as our political coverage and ran the coverage of political campaigns, presidential and senatorial and gubernatorial, uh, and then spent the last seven or eight years of my career at the Ledger at the, uh, on the editorial board, uh, mm -hmm. basically writing about state government and that yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to actually ask you about that last position, having been on the other side where you submit you know, articles. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people who are always submitting op-eds and at a paper the size of the Star Ledger. If you could give some insight into maybe just the sheer volume of submissions you got and what the process was like, how you sift through all those and decide the, the one or two which actually make it into the paper each day. 
Well, I think one of one of the basic standards certainly there it depends on who's writing it. If something's you know the governor or somebody's submitting a, a piece, you're going to pay more attention to it. Uh, although it, it's not a slam dunk that the mm -hmm. governor's submitting it, we I always told people that. Uh, I couldn't give them a commitment one way or the other until I had actually seen right. it, write it. They could tell me what a great idea it was, but I still had to see it. And also, um, one of the things that I like to uh, use as a standard was whether or not the person had some expertise in the area in which they were mm -hmm. writing about. Uh, you know, I just didn't want somebody from down the street off the top of their right. head. I mean, that was a letter to the editor. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a, an op-ed piece. Yeah, uh, you wanted some gravitas in the in the the writing if it's an op-ed piece and so that's sort of basically where I would, I would look at mm -hmm. that stuff and the volume was was fairly significant although not as significant as you might think but there was there was more than enough to, yeah. to fill the pages uh, that we had so right okay so. in your other job at the ledger down here and I guess when you initially went to Newark it was state of journalism was much different than it is today I mean you had a large bureau down here you had a Washington bureau which the ledger eventually closed um, um, and I guess, you know, leading into your current project, which is NewJerseyNewsroom.com, um, you're at the ledger, it's the state's largest newspaper. Um, there's been downturns in the industry nationally, you know, you're seeing layoffs, some other papers going out of business. And for a long time, I think the ledger kind of weathered the storm. But then I don't know if it was suddenly, but you know, there was a pretty dramatic announcement, I guess, you know, the fall or late summer of 08. Uh, when was it 08? Or? Uh, yeah, it was yeah. July 31st. So you remember the date very well. Yeah. <laughs> <in the morning. laughs> and at that time, I knew that this was basically the, the death of the paper. Uh, it, it, the, they just came out and said that they were offering everybody a one-year buyout, and uh, they had to get rid of 200 people. Yeah. And uh, if they didn't, they would either sell the paper or close it. Well, nobody was buying paper, so right. it was going to be closed, and that was the threat. Um, in the end, they had so many people heading for the exits that they had to sort of cut back yeah, I on remember the number that. of yeah, people yeah. that they would allow to leave. Editorial-wise, I think we had about 350 at the time, or 320, and, and 151 left uh, yeah. when, at the end of December of 08. And so it just brings you back. I mean, you can't possibly, no matter how much you try, you can't put out the same product that you right. did if you lose half the staff. It's yeah. just not going to work. And not only losing half the staff, but you lose people with institutional knowledge. You lose people, lose people who have expertise in certain areas that they've been writing about for a number of years. And so you really, uh, the paper just can't be the same. And of course, it goes into, I, I think, one of my things is that it, I think it's a bad move for democracy because mm -hmm. you have nobody watching the, exactly. the store anymore. As you were saying, and when you were down here and mm -hmm. I was here, there was tremendous competition among the papers. There were loads of people down. Like I said, we had 10 or 11, the Berkeley record, I don't know how maybe six or seven. Mm -hmm. Now the record and the ledger have combined bureau, right. which you would have never done in the past. Yeah. And I, I, maybe the, I don't know if there's six or seven people in it. It's, it's yeah, and, and the people who are there, not to certainly denigrate you know the folks, but you, you pointed out correctly that the people who were there when you were the bureau chief and a lot of the people who left had been covering their beats for years and years, had the institutional knowledge, had the contacts. And you know you have somebody just starting off in a beat and they can be a great reporter, but there's no substitute for the years on the job oh, like that. Exactly. I mean, you've, basically what they've done is replaced the older people with young kids and kids out of college. And so most of the stories you get are um, cops and robber stories or court stories. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe a council meeting, but there is no depth to the stories because they don't they don't have it, they don't know it, and so you you lose that. And uh, you now with with the way the situation is with government, um, who knows what's going on in New Jersey? Yeah, who knows what's going, right. going on or what's happening? And and nobody's going to be ever find about it because there's nobody you know watching them. It's 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 really I think a dangerous step for a democracy. But yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out because that's actually one of the things I wanted to talk about was that you know people see the numbers, they see maybe um, less reporters, or they see a newspaper going out of business, but um, it's not just a business thing. It has a direct effect on our daily lives on on democracy. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, very, very. I think very definitely, and I, I don't think we realize that yet, or have seen the impact of that yet. Yeah. But I mean, eventually you will. I think one of the the values of newspaper because you have websites now that that do things instantaneously, and it's all this news, 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 and yeah. and you get some people who say, well, newspapers all have yesterday in it, and it's yeah. so it's out of time and out of touch, and and that's true. 
But one of the values of the newspapers are not just the yesterday stories they do, but the sort of in-depth take a look right. at stories um, that that they find out. I mean, this the Ledger did the thing on University of Medicine and Dentistry and the scandal that went on mm -hmm. there. Um, it, that would have never happened if you didn't have uh, people who were, could afford the time and had the time to go and look and 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 investigate all that stuff. Um, and that's just not happening now yeah. anymore. And so you're not going to find these kind of things out. It's uh, and it's it's a shame. I think it's just, it's Go, this the way things are going. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is unfortunate. But I guess one of the maybe encouraging signs is there's a lot of new models out there, people trying new projects in journalism, which I know you're directly involved with. And I want to you know, talk with you about NewJerseyNewsroom.com. But I first just wanted to remind people that you know, if you are watching, you know, you know, check the chat feature. You know, if you have a question for myself or for Josh, you know, post it. And we'll try to get it on the air um, before the end of the show. But um, let's go back to like, you know, what happened on was July 31st, the date that's ingrained <laughs> in your mind. Um, you know, after that, I guess, you know, people made their decisions. Yeah, as you said, probably more people chose to take the buyouts than they expected. A number of them went into government, into PR jobs. Um, I don't know where other people went, but um, I guess about 40 or so, you know, journalists, you know, decided to come up with this project, New Jersey Newsroom. So uh, maybe tell me how, how that evolved, because like, I've seen it and I've you know, worked with you and with Andy and some other folks there, but um, you know, the origins I'm not that familiar with. It really was, as you, you said, Andy. It's Andy Lark. I can never say his last name. I, 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 yeah, like, I, I communicate with him via email, so I, I was counting on you to say so, it correctly. So. Just call him Andy. Yeah. And uh, Garrett uh, Morris. Right. Uh, we're really the two driving forces, and, and Matt Romanowski uh, are the ones who sort of put it all together. And it it does underscore um, the ease with which you can put mm -hmm. a, a, an operation together because you have basically no overhead. Right. Um, uh, it's a computer, and there there actually isn't a newsroom. Um, it's all done through computers in their homes. Mm -hmm. um, and you have no delivery costs, there's things like that. And so they're about, they asked who wanted to sign on. Um, there's no money, you get mm -hmm. no money involved. But you, it's basically built on the idea that if you've been a reporter or been a newspaper person, you, you want to continue doing that. Mm -hmm. So you do it even though you're not getting paid right. for it. Um, and that's what, what I've been doing. And it's pretty free. Uh, floating, uh, you do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and you so you, you respond. I mean, I've done several things. Then next week, uh, Christie's giving his budget address. Right. I'll probably do something on on that. I did stuff on the elections. Um, we have a couple of people, Tom Hester and, and Joe. Yeah, Terrell, Tom Hester's who, there pretty frequently. Pretty, yeah. yeah, he does pretty much the news stuff that's yeah. happening in the state house, um, and and most of the other people are will comment on things. Um, you, you get all. Carl Gold and yourself, mm -hmm. um, uh, Bob McHugh, and just different people commenting on, on uh, writing things. It gives them another outlet right. to get their, their message out. And what it sort of evolved into is sort of a, um, a variety of topics and issues. And over the, the past year, I guess it's it's not quite a year. It's, I think it was in April when they started mm -hmm. or around that. Yeah. Um, they've also had people come in from other places all over the country just to say that they wanted to, to write for them. And I suppose these are people who are sending their stuff to other places, but right. it's sort of interesting as lifestyle kinds of things and uh, other stuff. Uh, uh, but I think one of the things that bothers me with, maybe not so much with New Jersey Newsroom, but with also with just the, the web in general, there are no standards, and so Correct, yeah. the, the reader or the viewer is left to their own to figure out whether they can trust yeah. whatever they're reading. And it's, and in most cases, or not, I would say most cases, but situated like your your website, you know, it's it's legit and this mm -hmm. stuff is good and it's, it's all been vetted and you're not. But a lot of this other stuff, I mean, it's you know, you have people reporting on rumors on about rumors, yeah. and and so you know, it's all just. Uh, it, 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 there's nothing grounded, and um, and that I think is a danger because you don't have any. There is no filtering process. Correct, yeah. um, I was talking to somebody yesterday who worked at the Ledger now does PR, and he says lots of times the PR people can control things because they can send things to these websites and nobody. Right, they just go right. They up. They just no. go right up. Yeah. They, nobody questions whether it's 
it's right or wrong or um, checking the facts that this is, you know, indeed this did happen. It's just all out there. Yeah. Uh, I often wondered, I don't know if, you know, you have any thoughts on this, you know, during the last governor's campaign, there were, you know, a number of negative stories that got out there about Christie's, you know, you know, driving infractions, um, I guess the loans and things like that. And I remember when I was a reporter covering campaigns, you get tips like that from the campaigns all the time. And, you know, a lot of them wouldn't pan out or would never make their way into the media. And I'm just wondering if, you know, there's less filtering going on. And, and sometimes, you know, those things get on websites that maybe don't have the same criteria as a good journalism organization, but they eventually sometimes drive the mainstream press. If there's so much oh, chatter yeah. on one of those, they can't be ignored. Oh, yeah, exactly. I think we've seen that, you know, several times. Uh, I think just the past couple of weeks with David Patterson in New York. Right, uh, yeah. there's just, There were stories about, there were rumors on the websites that the New York Times was working on a story that was really going to, blow the yeah. doors off the place and in fact the times didn't have the story but people were reporting other rumors and yeah. rumors okay. and and a lot of uh, non uh, sort of uh, solid journalism play, well even a lot of tv stations mm -hmm. feel that it's enough if they report that such and such a website is reporting this right then that sort of lets them off the hook. Yeah, know, I mean, they're, they're actually they're anything. accurate, but yeah. you know, they've floated something that it, made it. Yeah, exactly, made it and what they're saying is accurate, that, yeah, this website mm -hmm. is reporting this, but nobody's bothering to check to see whether that's true or not. Yeah. And that's, that's sort of one of the dangers that you have with this. Yeah, well, I guess that's the world we live in today. Yeah, right? it is. It, it has great advantages because it allows you to get in touch with a lot more people. Mm. In your situation, allows you to get your message out. I'm sure it'll. Yeah, we more wouldn't people. have been able to create the whole institute as quickly as we did if yeah. it was 10 years ago, right. and we didn't have the web and all these other resources. And and it makes your information so available to people. I mean, they go on the website, you can check archives, you can check things that happen. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, I read this. It's you can get it in a matter of seconds, yeah. and so it it makes it a lot more available. And as you know yourself, information is is much more readily available. You Google and anything, you can get it right. in a couple of seconds, and it's. Uh, so if that, it's great, I think, you know, it's it's really an advance, but with it comes this other side, so. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned how fast you can get stuff from Googling. I'm always, get a chuckle out of um, all the president's men, and there's a, a great scene in there where um, Woodward and Bernstein are trying to find somebody, and obviously it's before the days of the internet and Google, and they're in the Washington Times, um, a Washington Post, um, mail room or phone room with a stack of phone books like looking for the guy and, and when I teach I use that as an example I said you know that's what reporters used to have to do yeah. it wasn't as easy as typing a name into a search engine search, so, right and coming yeah. up with a list of possibilities or you know no you're right yeah so how do you see New Jersey newsroom like kind of fitting into this new world or, and how has it evolved over this first year or almost a year. I know from my observations, you know, you had a lot of the former ledger writers initially, and I don't know if they've, you know, gone into other endeavors, you know, some of them, as you said, you know, weren't getting paid if they found jobs elsewhere, and, and then you're getting people, new people contacting you as well. So, you know, how is it taking shape? Well, that's, that's I think it has evolved, um, and I see it as, lots of times I see the stuff that they put up on the, at the top of the page, they have, revolving top yeah, 10 right. stories or something. And I wonder why they put that there. Um, and then it sort of dawns on me, it sort of appeals to a wider range. Mm -hmm. And so they'll have a, a recipe for something. And yeah, there's a real variety. Yeah, there somebody to... from the Olympics and somebody, uh, you know, about personal finance and, you know, yeah. somebody about Rutgers sports. And so it's sort of all, it's, it appeals to all these different people. And that, I think, is way it, it sort of evolved into a broader um, the, the focus they want to be in New Jersey, but it does, you have to, I think, sort of have a broader approach or mm -hmm. you, you're limiting your audience tremendously. They are also, one of the big things has been trying to do advertising. Um, they do have some advertising people now and uh, are making progress with uh -huh. that, getting some ads yeah. on. Um, so that will help pay some of the bills. Right. So, yeah, I know in uh, talking with Andy, he pointed out that you had all these journalists who knew how to write stories and cover stories, but you didn't have the ad people, the right, distribution yes. people, the business part of the right. operation. You, re you realize how important that is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Rich, we have a question here. Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, do you think the web has helped or hurt journalism and why? Okay. Do you want to take a crack at that? Uh, I, I think it's sort of a mixed bag um, because I, I, I think that it's helped journalism as if you're doing the research and you're doing, uh, you have to find things out, it, it helps you a lot. It helps you get your message out to, or your, your information out to a lot more people. 
But then also, as I said, you, you know, there's no, generally with the web, if, unless you're going to a reputable site, there's no way you can tell whether the information is accurate or not. Yeah. Uh, and so if you're going to one of the newspaper sites, you're pretty assured of that. If you're going to a think tank site, you're pretty much assured of that. Uh, <clears throat> but a lot of these other sites, it's just who knows who's writing what. It's, so, it's, so it's sort of a mixed bag. It's, it's helped, but it's also... Yeah, I'd have to agree with you. I think you know, the speed is obviously the big thing. You, know, you, you find out about news pretty much as it happens. And also the ability, if you're interested in a particular story or topic, you know, and you, don't, you want to read more than what's there in the story, if it's about a report, you can probably find the actual report on the web. And, yeah. you know, so that you, know, you now have the ability you know, to, to kind of tailor what you read to your interest. I think one of the other downsides is there's so many sites out there or cable TV outlets, whatever, that um, you can only watch things that match your ideology. And I don't think that's a good thing. Like you, whether you're conservative or liberal, you can, you know, watch or visit websites or news sites that report the news in a certain way. And, and I think we're missing out on, say, when we didn't have all these different outlets available, being exposed to you know, all, all different points of view. True, you're, you're, and I think the tendency of people is to go to those websites that they know are going to reinforce yeah. what they already think right. and, and say, gee, see, see that. And you're right, it's, it's that they're, you're not exposed to this more yeah. variety of, of uh, opinions and views. And uh, yeah, that is, that is a drawback. But I think overall, it's, I mean, I think it's a great benefit to, to the news yeah, gathering yeah. information. Yeah, it's and, so and, different and, from yeah. like when we, you know, cut our teeth in the newsroom. Yeah, and, yeah, and there's the speed with which you can. It, now, uh, say writing for New Jersey newsroom, uh, say an election night. Uh, in the past, you had deadlines you had to get done, and you could only write what you knew at that point. Right. Where this now, with I just file whenever it was done, and it, yeah. you know, and or you can update it three minutes later. It's you know, you don't it's, you, you avoid all those. Artificial sort of, well, I guess maybe they weren't artificial deadlines right. that you had to meet. Now yeah. it's sort of yeah. More as soon immediate. as it happens, you're yeah. writing and it's you can you know, it's on the it. air on the web almost yeah. right away. Yeah, if it's something that happens and changes, you can do it right away. Yeah, uh, the budget address is next week. You're gonna, if not be covering it, probably writing about it. So we can read that on NewJerseyNewsroom.com. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have the web address on our screen, mm -hmm. and we're just about out of time. So on a Thank you, Josh, for joining us today and you know talking about state of journalism, a little bit of government and politics in New Jersey, and I uh, encourage everyone to you know read your stuff and other information on NewJerseyNewsroom.com. Well, thanks for having me. Okay, it's been great. Thanks um, for joining us. Uh, you've been watching the Hall Institute Public Forum. My name is Rich Lee. Um, we don't have a show planned for next week. Um, we actually have a Hall Institute event, a gala reception, an annual dinner we do next Thursday. Um, but we'll be back shortly after that. I um, encourage you to visit our website and we'll have news about our next guest and our next topic. Thank you and we'll see you next time.